Thank you very much. And like others, I'd like to, to thank uh, NEB for this award. Um, you know, for me, an award is a little bit like a reference letter and, um, and it has like two components. One is the content of the letter and then it's the other thing is the person who signs the letter is sometimes more important than the actual content. And so for me, getting this award from NEB is impor important and something that I'm very grateful for because NEB is a cool company in an ocean of very uncool companies. So, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So, um, I'm working in a program called Eliminate Dengue. We've been working for around uh, 10 years now, and, um, and we work with a, a lot of different people in, in different countries. Currently, our operations are sitting in five countries, Australia in the, at the top, and in Brazil, Colombia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And what we're doing is trying to focus on a problem um, that is, um, is a hideously large problem. So if we, and we're focused on the viral diseases that are transmitted by the mosquito Aedes aegypti. So the first of these is dengue. And so for dengue, um, um, it's a huge problem around the world that many people may not appreciate. Um, this viral disease is costing close to $9 billion every year in direct cost to governments. But not only that, um, it's really um, creating a huge social and economic burden on families uh, where around 40% of the costs, health costs are borne by the family and these costs can be up to three months of, um, of the income of that family. Um, so it's a major uh, burden and it's not a small problem. We have around half of the world's population is at risk of acquiring dengue in any given year and it's estimated that around 390 million people are infected each year. So it's a huge problem and no current solution for it. And then we just heard, uh, I think, in, in some previous talks, mention of this thing called Zika. Um, Zika is a virus quite similar to dengue. It's transmitted by the same mosquito. And so it was originally um, isolated uh, in Uganda from the Zika forest, a research forest where a lot of virology has been done over the years. Um, and then it had, as we heard uh, in the previous talk, there was scattered transmission going on until there was a huge um, uh, outbreak of Zika in South America in the last year. So most people would have been aware of what's been happening in Brazil. And one of the real terrible things around Zika are uh, the deformities that it's causing in new baby, newborn babies, where we're seeing uh, problems in brain development and these babies born with microcephaly. So in Brazil, um, you know, normally we would see around 163 cases nationwide of microcephaly reported, babies with uh, small heads, in the last year almost 2,000. And these are children or babies that will if they do survive, um, are going to have lifelong uh, uh, caring needs. And so placing huge burdens on families that really can't afford um, the, the disaster of it. And also um, other syndromes are now being recognised as well. Guillain-Barre syndrome, for example. Um, and I think the, a, a greater appreciation of the breadth of the syndrome associated, neurological syndrome associated with Zika virus. So it's been roaring through South America in the last year, as everybody I imagine knows here and, and is on your doorstep, certainly transmissions occurring in Florida at the moment. In the work we're doing in Southeast Asia, we're now seeing it spill into Southeast Asia with uh, microcephaly being reported uh, just in the last month in Thailand and Vietnam. Singapore's reporting hundreds of cases and uh, KL as well. And I think we can expect in the next month or so, uh, governments declaring the actual extent of the Zika problem in Southeast Asia, um, which is a direct flow on from what's happening in um, South America. So we think we have a solution to this problem and um, I'd like to try and walk you through very quickly what it is. And it involves a microorganism uh, called Wolbachia, which some of the people at NEB know about. But this is a slightly different Wolbachia. This is a Wolbachia that lives in insects. And it's estimated that around uh, 60 percent uh, uh, of all insect species carry Wolbachia naturally, but not the mosquito that transmits these viruses, Aedes aegypti. And so, what? And, and so, just some key features of it: it's naturally occurring. It's vertically transmitted. So this is a strange microorganism in that it lives in insects and gets passed from one generation to the next in the eggs of the insect. 
Um, and it's, and uh, that it's quite safe for humans and animals in the environment. It occurs naturally, but just not in this one species of mosquito. And the key point here is that when we introduce it and so change the microbiome of this uh, insect uh, species, what we find is that the mosquito is no longer able to support the replication of any of these viruses. And so if the mosquito can't, if the virus can't replicate in the mosquito, then it can't be transmitted. So that's the key point of what the work here is we're doing. So this bacteria has some other key features which make it um, really interesting in a public health intervention space. And so this is something called cytoplasmic incompatibility. So if you're a male insect and you have Wolbachia, these little green dots, and you mate with a female insect that doesn't, then all of the eggs that that female lays will die. They're, they won't develop properly, and I won't go into the scientific details behind that, just take my word for it. But if um, the female insect has Wolbachia, then her eggs will hatch and all of her children will have Wolbachia. And similarly, if a female has it but a male doesn't, we get the same effect. So this agent, without being, uh, doesn't need to be infectious to be successful. It's able just to be vertically transmitted and do this thing here, manipulate the reproduction, and it can both spread into an insect population and maintain itself, even if it puts a genetic load on that population. And this is the key to the success of this bacterial agent and why it's so common in the environment. It also makes for a fantastic uh, public health intervention because once this um, bacterium has been released into a mosquito population, because of this action, it will maintain itself in that uh, population and so it will be sustainable. And so it won't need reapplication. It makes a really lousy business model. There's nothing really here to sell, but it makes a great public health intervention. And as a, as a result, we're structured as a not-for-profit. So um, just to show you a little bit of some modelling that's been done at Imperial College, not by us, but by others, showing the likely impact on dengue, and which is, uh, it can be extrapolated to Zika, as well, and um, this is just based on real-world data where we've been feeding patients in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam on mosquitoes with and without Wolbachia, and then estimating the reduction in transmission and from that, the, the reduction in disease through simulation models. And this is showing that for Dengue 1 compared to Dengue 2, 3, and 4, that we see within a very short period of time almost 100% reduction in, in transmission, virus transmission. And then that reduction is then sustained. These are in different R0 settings, which is a measure of the intensity of the force of transmission of the infectious disease. And so most Dengue r noughts usually would sit between 1.5 and 3.5 we see some little rebound occurring um, around 50 years after introduction uh, for Dengue 1 under extreme r naught conditions, but we think these models are, are fairly conservative. So the bottom line is this intervention, at least on the modelling that's being done, suggests very quick and very large impact on these diseases. And so what's involved in doing this, because this is an intracellular bacterial agent, um, and it's vertically transmitted, we actually have to release mosquitoes in the environment to seed them with Wolbachia. And then those mosquitoes will mate with wild mosquitoes and Wolbachia will then take care of the, of the rest of the business, if you like, and spread itself into the mosquito population. So you can imagine a, a situation here where we've got wild mosquito population with no Wolbachia. We then undertake a series of releases uh, to deploy Wolbachia to a certain period where we have a frequency above a key threshold frequency, which I won't go into, and then Wolbachia will take care of the rest itself, spread itself into all of the mosquitoes in that area, and then sustain itself going forward. And we release mosquitoes in different way. Here is one of our uh, people working for us in Colombia, releasing adult mosquitoes that have been grown in the laboratory. Um, here is uh, one of the people working with us in Brazil with a bucket where they'll be putting eggs, the mosquito eggs, into that water and letting them grow up uh, naturally in the environment. And here is um, a child in Australia where we're doing uh, deployments of this method in a citizen science approach using school children to actually do, um, do the work with a, a, a piece of science curriculum structured around the intervention. So different ways that we can put it out. And here's some data um, from the very first work we did in Australia nearly six years ago now where we first released mosquitoes. So this was a period of time uh, this little green shading when the actual releases took place. So we released mosquitoes for 10 weeks. 
once t one day each week we would release the equivalent of 10 mosquitoes per house in an area. We did that 10 times. And then these, this is looking at these two locations, the Wolbach air frequency in the mosquitoes, and you can see that it climbs during the release period, then continues to climb, and then has maintained itself at above 90% for however long that is now, and in, in appears to be continuing in an ongoing way. We can take these mosquitoes from the field and bring them back to the lab and we show that we, they're not uh, competent to transmit dengue. Not only that, is that we can measure uh, dengue in the, in the surrounding communities and we can see that there is no dengue transmission has occurred in this site during the last six years. This is just some more observational data on efficacy. This is showing the city of Townsville where we've now deployed Wolbach here in Northern Australia. It's a small regional city in Australia of around 250,000 people. We've, uh, we've uh, in the process of deploying from late 2014. This is showing you um, locally, well, before I explain it, just to give context to this graph, there is not endemic transmission of, of dengue in northern Australia. It's brought in by travellers each year and then we get local transmission occurring from imported cases and that's usually people going to Bali for holidays or something like that and they bring it back. And so we have a background of imported cases, small numbers of imported cases trickling into our northern Australian cities and you can actually see that, that this is getting worse over time and this just reflects the growing problem of dengue as a disease, that the disease burden is increasing across the world as we don't really have any effective means to control it. And, um, and this is then local transmission that's triggered from these um, imported cases. There hasn't been a 12-month period, these are over one-month uh, intervals, and there hasn't been a 12-month period in the last 10 years um, where there hasn't been uh, trans local transmission of cases. And then we released Wolbachia here. We've had no cases here except for these three, but each of these three cases occurred in areas outside the deployment area as we were putting the deployment in place. So it really effectively no, no transmission in this city since Wolbachia has been deployed and we see that in all of the places that we're working, a complete knockdown in transmission. So um, currently um, we're working in these different locations. I'm based here with a number of other 60 other people in Melbourne um, and we've been working for the last six years in the field in northern Australia. Uh, where we're just about to uh, complete our deployments. Um, we're running a large randomised controlled clinical trial in Indonesia to get the gold standard evidence, if you like, on the impact. Um, these clinical trials take a long, they're, they're complex, they're expensive and they take a long time to, to complete. So it's still got around two and a half to three years before it's completed. And we're doing a similar study with a slightly different design in central Vietnam that again will take a number of years. But you know, Zika and, um, and Dengue are not waiting for clinical trials to be completed. And the World Health Organization has declared a global emergency for Zika and we desperately need um, new interventions or something that has a, pr a prospect for working when currently nothing is working at all. And, um, and so, the World Health Organization has recommended scaled up deployments of Wolbachia um, in, uh, while we wait for the clinical trial data to come through based on the, the, both the modeling that's been done and also the observational data that's coming out from existing deployments. And as a result, we've been working in Colombia in the city of Medellin and also in Rio de Janeiro with doing small pilot deployments. Um, last week in London, I was able to announce um, that we're going to do expanded deployments over the next two years in both of these cities where we'll, we hope to be able to cover around two and a half million people in each city. And so um, as well as we hope provide a very powerful protective effect, we'll be able to get a type of evidence uh, data that we uh, can't, uh, which will complement what's coming out of our more traditional clinical trials, but being done on a larger scale. So. Um, that's where we're sitting at the moment. Um, we have a plan that if everything keeps going well, what we would like to see happen over the next 10 years or so, where we hope to be able to um, deploy Wolbachia uh, globally uh, in all of the major countries where these diseases are a problem. Thank you.